Good evening, Marathon fans. We're coming to you from the Supper Club. Sutter Club. It's a Supper Club. Right next to the finish line of the People's Marathon, California International Marathon, which played host to this morning to the USATF Marathon Championships that saw Futsum Zenesalasi become a US champion in his debut marathon running 211.01, and Paige Stoner taking the course record running 226.02. I'm joined here with my good friend Jeff Burns. Jeff is a PhD in exercise sciences and working for Team USA, exercise physiologist. You're a marathoner yourself, 224 marathoner and a US 100K champion. Jeff, I mean, we had a, we had a fantastic morning this morning. Um, what did you think? What's your, what's your first assessment of what we saw today? I would say first assessment is that bricks are red, the Pope is Catholic, and people run fast at CIM. Yep. We, we definitely saw that. So cutting into this, OTQs, this has become not just a BQ factory, but an OTQ factory. And we've known that uh, over the past Olympic trial cycle, which this marathon saw more Olympic trials qualifiers than any of the three majors in the U.S. combined. And that's due to a few different factors. The weather is always great here. The course is, is a fantastic course for running fast. And then people coming in droves really help each other to push to fast times. The boats, the river, the, the river of fast times, I think, delivered. Fair Oaks Boulevard was swimming, <laughs> perhaps, with uh, people running very, very fast. And, and that's why... That's why this race is so, um, so fast, is, is that confluence of factors, everything you just said. And today, today epitomized that. I mean, there was a lot of, there were question marks around the weather going in, um, but everybody came here because the course is fast and everybody came here. Therefore, there were lots of people going for it and going, you know, trying to go fast and all of it delivered. And you saw not just people running fast up front, which they did, um, especially in the women's race. Um, but you then also saw the depth, I think, go all the way down. And we saw lots of men run personal bests and um, really, really deliver on that front. The depth is what this race is known for. And Sacramento, sitting at the confluence of the American and Sacramento rivers, has led us to, uh, to refer to this course as a river of asphalt itself. And uh, you saying that the, in Comrades, at the Comrades Marathon in South Africa, they call them buses of, of groups of runners that work together. And out here on the River of Asphalt down Fair Oaks Boulevard, we've, we're starting to call them boats. Get in the lifeboat and jump in with your people to make Motor it to the boat. finish. Motorboat along. <laughs> uh, merrily down Fair, Fair Oaks Boulevard. But let's jump into this a, a little bit and uh, let's look at... 31 men ran under 218, uh, which is the, the new Olympic trials qualifier. And the Olympic trials qualifier on the women's side, we all know, was slashed eight minutes from the previous cycle, going from 245 to 237. And still, 36 women came across under 237 today. Yeah, the women really delivered on that front. But even the men... I mean, that's a faster time for the men as well. So to go from 219 down to 218 and still have 31, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention in our preview calling out that there would be 30 men qualify. Almost there. But yeah, it was, um, it was pretty incredible on that front. And, and I think it, it gets back to that idea of everybody coming here with the ambition of doing it and the intent of doing it. And we saw that we saw that land, and 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 I think the women really stepped up to the plate on that front of of getting after it big time. Um, and even given given all of that, we talked about going into this race too. There were 300 athletes uh, combined on the men's and women's side who were within striking distance of that Olympic trials qualifier, and still. That's about 20%, so 60, a little over 20%, uh, 67 people that did it. So it just goes to show you that conditions can be perfect, 
as they as they are a lot of the time at CIM and you have everything set up for you but the marathon is a brutal beast out there and you have to like you say compete against others but you're competing against the race itself too yeah that's one of the big challenges with literally every marathon and why it's a beautiful race and why we all come to watch them and do them and take it on is is all of these athletes are racing each other and they're racing the clock but they're racing the distance 26.2 miles 42.2 kilometers that is a very long way to try and run pretty fast for an extended period of time and it it is there are just big there's volatility in that in the sense of of what it does to the body and where you go because you can't perfectly simulate that in training so it has just this big unknown that you know no other no other distance on the track does um and so when you have you know here a lot of people venturing into that unknown the turbulent waters on the river of fair oaks boulevard they're going into it together and i think you see you see what happens when people venture into that unknown and take on the distance together rather than alone you get a lot of them you get a lot yeah a lot more being successful but you also get a lot not being successful and as much as we like to celebrate the successes you know talking about 300 potential people that are within striking distance and only about 20 percent making it there's still a big uh there's still just that big you know brutality that is associated with this beautiful brutal event and that that's what keeps people coming back for more is that it is it is an almost unslayable beast and and it keeps you coming back to try and uh try and slay it each time uh but not only there were so there were two storylines that we were looking at going into today there was that otq story that we were looking at and and make or keeping our our eye on how many people would attain that mark but also this was the USATF Marathon Championship, so somebody was going to be crowned champion, um, the top American marathoner today. And let's take a look at the course profiles for that race to, to understand kind of what they were attacking here and what, what the, the, le the playing field was for them to make their moves and try to attain that top honor. Yeah, the course here is... Um pretty unique it's point to point and we'll see it we'll see it play out yeah it's on the screen right now go ahead and talk through it Jeff yeah so we uh, we start up in up in Folsom and have this have this pretty sharp downhill first mile or so um, and then you turn on to Oak Avenue not Fair Oaks Boulevard yet you turn on to Oak Avenue and go through almost 10K, and it's, it's generally rolling. It's, it's, net, it's net downhill for sure, so you can get going quite, quite fast. And usually you would see if you were running dead even physiological effort, you would be running faster for the first 5K and 10K for sure. And then you turn on to Fair Oaks Boulevard, which you take to the Sacramento city limits, and it probably through about 10 miles, which is uh, Fair Oaks Village, um, it's again rolling and I would say the probably 10 to 15 K is where you might slow down a little bit. And then after you get out of Fair Oaks village, uh, you go through halfway and then you're just on very, very long, mostly, you know, flat, gradual down stretches into the city. And then past 20 miles, you hit the city limits and then you're just counting down street numbers starting at, I think 57th Avenue might be the first one you see all the way down to... I don't know if it's 8th or 7th that they then turn on to near the Capitol. So long, so, long, long, long stretches in. And that's where, that's where the race is oftentimes. And today we saw, especially in the men's race, um, that's where the moves are made. Yeah, that final 10K we discussed uh, before the race, that that is the crucible. And that's where this, that's where this race is won or lost. And, and you can say that for a lot of marathons that they always say, well, 20 miles is the halfway point. And then you have the final 6.2. But in this one in particular, that's when the course flattens out and it kind of begs you to, to race it if you have anything left. And this, we've seen a couple different strategies win on this course before. But most often, we've seen people sit back in the pack and then attack that last 10K with a vengeance and really drop their times and negative split there. Because that's where... Uh, the way that this course is laid out, 
that's the, that's the playing field. So if you go out hard at the beginning, you're going to lose some time there and you have to hold on. But if you go out in the pack and you bide your time, then you can jump on it and try to reel in those guys or, or women in the front. Absolutely. And, and I think on the flip side, too, getting back to that start in Folsom, when you have these like, you know, sharper or, or more aggressive downhills, you similarly can lose the race early on. And, and that is true in all marathons where you can lose the race early. But here, the course just tempts you to run faster. So thinking about all of those people who didn't hit the OTQ or at the elite field, the people that we were pegging to be contenders that ended up dropping out. A lot of times it happens because they do too much there. And, and uh, I think we saw both of those play out today. Um, but yeah, definitely, certainly in the men's race, that, that stretch once you hit the city limits was where the real, racing, the real racing started. Well, let's turn our attention to the men's race now because uh, going into that one, we had a, a, uh, the guy wearing the number one bib, the defending champion from Davis, California. So this is basically his hometown marathon, and he loves this race. And last year, after he won the race, stood up on the stage at the award ceremony and proclaimed this is the people's marathon and that he wanted to come here and win it, which he did, running 2.11.21, going out solo, 4.58 pace through the first 20 miles, and then holding on at, uh, to 5.14 pace through that final 10K. He did that, or he had that same strategy in mind today with, I would say, less help. From the very beginning, from the outset, even at mile one, he had a five meter gap on the rest of the field and continued that on, uh, gapping the field by 43 seconds at halfway. So he reached half marathon. Let's see here. 64.51. 64.51. 43 second gap back to a group of five that was chasing him that had kind of coalesced together and were working to to hawk him down but at that point he was still gaining time on them yeah he was it looked like he was accelerating through there and i mean to put 43 seconds on them at half um i don't i don't know what he went through last year in but that's i mean that's a man on a mission getting after it and getting at you know what we had talked about one of the essentially the two strategies of winning this race of either go out hard, try and hang on, which we've seen success, especially on the women's side in the past, or, you know, let somebody go out hard, sit back in a pack and then eat them up. And it looked like he was trying the, the former and, um, yeah, was definitely putting, putting, uh, putting dents into everybody at that point. What, out of curiosity, as you were, cause you were in the lead vehicle for the men watching this, how did he look at, I mean, when you, when you saw him make that move and you, I know you were probably thinking about these two strategies we had talked about. Are you thinking it looks like this could stick or at halfway, were you thinking like, he looks like there's some strain in that, that he might get eaten up on J street once they hit uh, town? Well, I, I think it's tough to tell at that point still. Um, I would say he looked good, but there was some strain on his face at halfway. And um, I think when you go out that far or that hard and, and you gap the field that much, rarely do we see that, that kind of tactic um, prove out. So he was going for Jerry Lawson's course record, which was set in 1993, 210.27, which for, for the amount of uh, talented athletes that race on this course and for how marathon times have dropped significantly over the last few years 21027 is still a very attainable time uh, Absolutely. for a lot of the men in this race and it just shows like how this course is it is still a difficult course and he went after it last year on pace through about 21 miles and came up under a minute shy and he was on a mission this year going into it he knew he was fitter than last year. Uh, his training was going well. And, and that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to go gun to tape and, and take this thing and, and beat Jerry Lawson's course record set in 1993. So that was, that was his mission. And I, you could see him starting to strain at around mile 17, I would say. Because it looked like when we look at his paces or speeds, he went through 25K 
slowing down a little bit. And I think that's usually kind of like a tremor in the earthquake of like, if you are accelerating in a race, as soon as you, your splits not only stop speeding up, but slow down just a little bit, that can usually be the sign that, uh, that the avalanche might be coming. Um, and so you said at, at 17, it really looked like the strain visibly appeared and yeah. things started to shift. It was starting to come up then. And at mile 17, actually, his wife Jonah was there and his parents were there. Uh, legendary Davis High School coach Bill Gregg, his father. So they were cheering him on. And, uh, and you could see that he really wanted to do this and his family knew what, what his goal was today. And, uh, and I wanted him to do it too, being from the area. Uh, but that's, that's about when you saw it and, and going into mile 18. But right behind him there, that pack was starting to roll and they had really started to gain momentum of that group of five. And that was uh, Daniel Mesfun who was there. And Joel Rishow was in the pack as well. Jacob Thompson, the Australian, Ed, Easy Ed Goddard was in there too. And uh, I'm missing somebody, I think. Who else was in there? Is that Footsum Thompson? Oh, um, Footsum Zenesalasi. I and it's e it was easy to overlook him there too because that group, each of them were taking turns leading there, but Footsum never took a step in the lead. He just sat there the entire time. And that's perhaps a bit of foreshadowing. But I was going to ask you too. So we're moving past half, past 25k. Were you were you guys seeing that second pack at all through this while while Greg was out way out front? Were you guys going back and seeing what was going on there at all? We dipped back a little bit and looked at the second pack, and then there were a few boats behind them as well. Okay, a major boat right at 218, obviously. Yeah. And it's amazing when you when you drive up right next to that pack because you can hear all the foot strikes on the asphalt too, and it's like just a low thundering roll down the strip. The the sound the sound the poetic sound of uh, postmodern footwear echoing <laughs> through the Northern California uh, dawn. <laughs> yep, in their natural habitat along the CIM course. Uh, but yeah, we dipped back a little bit and we could see that pack of five, but for a while, for the majority of the race, as we turned through the course, you couldn't see them if you were just following uh, Brendan Gregg up front. But they passed him right around mile 18, so shortly after 25K, before, before 30K, if I have my, my numbers correct there. Um, the, yeah, and afterwards, like he, he didn't have much left and wasn't able to hold on with them, but they kept rotating there. And I would say the two major players in that pack afterwards were Jacob Thompson and Ed Goddard that were pushing the pace at the front and rotating. And every once in a while, you'd get Daniel Mesfon up there too, taking the lead. Joel Rishow was trying to hang on. And credit to that guy too. He had a three minute PR on the course today too. Wow. But yeah, Footsum was a ghost there. Like he was just sitting there haunting them. And so, so it looked like after 30K, you said they, they reeled him in. But by, by 35K, so now we're back in the city limits, coming down J Street. Um, long boulevards, that group of five is still together. Now we get to right around 35K, so that's 22 and a half miles, and we've got um, at that point less than four miles to run. Um, at what 35K, happens? so at 30, I would say right at 35K. Perhaps it was planned, after. maybe we can ask him. Yeah. <laughs> it was like Footsum was shot out of a cannon. Like he just, he stepped on the gas and that mile from 22 to 23 was about 502, but the majority of that came in the second half because he immediately gapped the rest of those guys and nobody went with him. And he secured basically a 40 second gap within the next couple miles. And between 35K and 40K, so this is the point on the course that we, we always talk about. This is, this is where stuff happens. This is where the race is won or lost. And if, and if you take that strategy of sitting back in the pack, it, this is where you have to go. Because you don't just make that decision to go in that moment, you make it at the starting line. And if you don't go then, somebody else will in that pack. And, and he, from 35 to 40K, he ran 449 pace for that 5K. So he ran, four, did he run 14, 14.50, was it 14.59? 14.59 for that 5K. 
And and it's interesting for you know for everyone if you haven't run the race or, or seen it, that section of the course is just like I said, it's a long straight. And you have one at like thirty second Street. You have one like two block. You know left right. But other than that, it's just a long straight shot through by and large neighborhoods. And if you're having a good day, you're oblivious to it all and you're just streaking down there. But if you're having a bad day, you're going backwards and you're counting down street numbers. And I think, you know, Footsome blew it up there. What, 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 what did the other guys do? We had five guys in that pack. Footsome blows it up. You know, what does Thompson do? What does is, what is Rishow do? Well, at that point, from the results that we have here, we could see that uh, Jacob Thompson, this, at this point, the lead truck, pulled ahead and we had to get to the finish ah. line so it's the tough part about this course too is that you're not able to watch the full the full section of that uh that last two two k or so yeah. stretch but it was obvious that that Futsum was he was the aggressor there and and then thompson was able to pull away by about 20 seconds too on on joel Rishow there who actually sitting in that pack too um he he came out he came out on top there. Yeah, so. and I talked to Jacob afterwards, too, about this, and he said, he's like, at 35K, Footsome went, and there was no chance I was going with him. But he was feeling good and moving. So I think it was, I mean, it was literally exactly that of, like, Footsome made not just a decisive move and change gears, but it was like he switched cars. And, <laughs> yes. and the rest of the guys, I think, I think Jacob at that point knew he was racing for second, it sounded like, but then putting the herd on the other guys. And it just, I think that was where everybody else basically started emptying their own tank. And, and we kind of saw that, you know, what the result of that was. <laughs> yeah. And, and talking about this, go, like beforehand too, we know this race to be a springboard for, for the top marathoners in the United States yeah. too. And they go on and run other races. They come back to, uh, to CIM because it is the People's Marathon. But Futsum Zenesalasi is he's somebody to be reckoned with now on the scene. And this is his first marathon. But how he closed this marathon, you got to watch out down in Disney World, I would say. Yeah. And it's funny when you think about, I, you know, people who go on to have storied marathon careers... I think a lot of times you see debuts like this. Like this actually reminds me somewhat of, of Robert Di Costello's marathon debut um, in Australia. I think, Do tell. I think he ran. Um, it might have only been 2:14, but it was it was I think the Australian Championships, and this is back in. Oh, uh, this has been, been the late 70s, maybe. Um, but the plan was essentially, you know, Di had established himself as a cross-country runner, a 10K runner, much like Futsum, um, and went into the race knowing he could run fast, but the express intention was, was go easy in the first half or feel totally in control so you can blast at the second half and essentially have somewhere to go for your next one. Have a good experience here and then go on to the future. And so Di ran... You know, it was like 214, I think, something like this. This is, again, back in the 70s. Sure. Um, but then just built on that. And I think that's a, that's a fantastic way to debut of, of to not, not necessarily leaving something on the tank or in the table, but, but being overly conservative, racing it, so you're excited to go on to something bigger. And I think Footsome, like, certainly left the door open for that. But, yeah. he, I mean, it's funny looking at his, um, his background. I mean, for people who don't know, he was a stud at Northern Arizona University, correct? Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you know, I don't know off the top of my head his, his track credentials at the shorter distances. He's a, is it 13 teens? 13 20? I don't think he's quite that low. I know that he's a 27.52 man. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the key thing that's very interesting about him is it seems like his credentials get better as you go longer. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, just because he's a 27... 50, what is it, 2752? Doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be a great marathoner, but if that 2752 is much better than what his 5K is, respectively, then it, then it becomes intriguing for his prospects, and I think he played, he played that out today well. Well, yeah, I think we, know, we knew that he had the talent. Now we know that he has the strength to deliver that, and he's, he was a bully on the course today. Uh, the way that he threw it down was very decisive and, uh, and uh, 
intimidating, I would say. Uh, but yeah, so Futsum Zenesalasi of the NAZ Elite takes the win, 2-11-01 today. Jacob Thompson, second, great result for him, Under Armour athlete, 2 11 It's also, I think, over two-minute PR for oh, him as well. Over so two-minute PR Slashing. Sla and Joel Rishow, Minnesota Distance Elite, too, 2 12 11 and that's over a three-minute PR for him as well. So that's your top three on the men's side. Let's turn our attention to the women's race here. Yeah, and the women's race, I think, was one that in some ways bucked our prediction or trend of um, this idea of being kind of two different strategies of going out hard, hanging on, or hanging back and eating up the people who went out hard. We really, from very early in the race, like I think it was 5K in, we established a group of four women, essentially, that, um, that were out front. It was Lauren Hurley. This was her debut marathon. Um, she's had, she's coming from triathlon, I believe. Um, Good and, 10K runner on the track as and, well. Yeah, she's put up some pretty impressive track performances, which are, which is notable for not having a background in, you know, a long background in competitive distance running to come into the sport and run, was it 15, 17 for the 5k? And then what was it for the 10k? High 31 forties. Yeah. I believe. Um, solo at that. Um, and so she's been on a tear. So this was her debut marathon. So it was her Paige Stoner who ran 228 at the marathon project, Elena Tab, um, who, did she also run in 228? Was she in that ballpark? She did as, at the marathon project. Yeah. I, in the ball, I think it might have been 229. Um, and then Molly Bookmeyer. So you had these four women who really established themselves at the start. And then basically by 10K, Hurley and Stoner had separated themselves. And, and, uh, and Tab was, um, or it was shortly after 10K. Um, separated themselves, and then Tab was kind of um, maybe 20, 30 meters back. But then from that point on, it was a two-woman race. It was Hurley and Stoner just, um, you know, woman, woman against woman, just slugging it out, just running literally shoulder to shoulder, mile after mile after mile after mile. And it was pretty interesting watching them because... Um, yeah, they had separated, and Elena Tab was back in back in third, not too far back. Maybe you know, it was kind of extending from ten to twenty seconds. But by halfway, um, you know, they hit they hit halfway in uh, seventy two twenty, which is two twenty four forty pace. That's bl wait. Let me correct you real quick, or let me correct both of us. Okay. Elena Tab best two thirty thirty three from Boston. Okay. Last good. year. That's good context yeah. because. She had a good race today. Um, but, yeah, so halfway, halfway the women went through in, in 72-20. And it was pretty interesting because I was watching it, like, after, after Hurley and Stoner had broken away, there were times pretty early on where it looked like Stoner was almost yo-yoing a little bit. It's like she'd lose maybe three, four meters and then speed back up to get back on Hurley. And I was thinking, I'm like, man, is she... Is she hurting a little bit and just maybe spending too much coin early on? And, um, and yeah, they, you know, that kind of played out. And, and by halfway, I think early on, it, it definitely looked like Lauren Hurley was, was feeling the best between the two of them or moving the best. So through halfway, those were the three main, main yes. contenders there. And Lauren Hurley was the aggressor at that point. I would say, yeah, aggressor, or at least in the, in the driver's seat. And, I mean, it's interesting looking, talking about how, um, you know, the, those early parts of the race egging them on. They went through the first 5K in 17.16. Their next 5K after that was 17.03. And then they were back on 17.13, which is probably the slowest 5K of the course, even though they were speeding up. Um, and so they were just, they were flying at that point. And again, they sped up even further from that 15K to halfway point where they were running essentially 529 mile pace for that, for those, um, you know, almost four miles. And so again, getting, they were on 224, 40 pace, which one of them, that's a debut. And one of them, that would have been nearly four minute PR. Um, so 
it was clear watching. I'm like, wow, I think one of these women, this is going to stick, but there's going to be some collateral damage here. Um, so knowing what you know about these two athletes at this point, too, their backgrounds, uh, and, and at this point, after halfway, it was a two-woman race, you would say. Yes, yeah. And, and it was interesting because Paige Stoner has... She has the, she's done the marathon is, and you know, notably she runs for the Reebok Boston track club, which is coached by Chris Fox. And he's a, um, you know, legendary coach in terms of, you know, coaching Syracuse men's team to a national championship, had his own storied career in the marathon and longer distances. Um, so he knows how to coach. And, and so I knew she was probably prepared quite well, um, but Hurley was the big, the big question mark. And so you're looking, when you're looking at somebody two runners going that fast, I'm thinking like, man, like Stoner might have already shown her cards in terms of what her, you know, ballpark of her capabilities are. If that's, you know, certainly she could run faster than 228, but could she take three or four minutes off that? Whereas Hurley is like, well, maybe this is just huge upside. So I was at that point thinking, you know, Hurley might be doing this, but there's a but. <laughs> um, after going into about 30K, there was this moment in the course where up until this point, Stoner had never been ahead of Hurley. She was always either next to her or like a step or two behind her. Um, and so it always looked like she was kind of just hanging in there. Going into 30K, she, like, there, she was a step ahead. And I just remember thinking like, that looks like she's in control. Like 30K she, is the point of the course where they're getting into the city there. So this, yep. is, this is almost go time. Yep, you're, you're about two, two and a half miles outside the city. And so at that point, there was this little shake. It was like a tremor. And I, I just remember thinking like, no, I think, I think this is where, like, this is, that is, that's a very subtle power move. And then sure enough, um, about a mile down the road, just past 30K, she made a bigger move and she put a gap on her of about mm, five seconds and started to, uh, started to move away. And then it just opened up and opened up. And the interesting thing is she really was uh, holding distance, I would say, um, or holding speed, whereas uh, Hurley started fading behind her and she just marched onto the finish and it just, that gap grew. She ran another, I think probably... Oh, it was like 17, she was right around 17.20, 17.30 for those, those uh, 5K splits from 30K and 35K, um, whereas kind of Hurley was going backwards and ran 17.50s to 18.10s. So dropping um, down to mile pace, 17.20 to 17.30s yes. is about five. Yeah, uh, so she was rattling off um, about 5.35s. So 535s in that in that segment, whereas Lauren Hurley was fading to 546s and then down to 552s. So um, I would say a much more evenly paced race than Sarah Vaughn's course record last year, which she she ran 226.53, closing in 528 pace for that final 10k. Uh, but or after she had run about 543 pace. So um, Paige Stoner closing in mid 530s is is more evenly paced yep throughout. yep and she definitely faded in the end like by that 30 35 to 40k she was running 539s and then 40 to 42k 548s <laughs> pace um so she was she was fading and her the time she ended up crossing the line in 22602 which is a two and a half minute pr i think best and a 51 second course record too 51 second course record so she had a big positive split um, that's 17, about 72.40 to 73, or 72.20 to 73.40, um, but held on. Whereas, again, Hurley um, had kind of the, the, I mean, a more extreme version of that. And Lauren Hurley, to her credit, uh, hung in there. And, I mean, she finished in 227.41, so a minute 41 back. And that minute 41 came in the last 12 kilometers, in and, the last seven and a half miles. And that is a debut time, too. Second, yes. second in the United States, got the, the silver today in the U.S. Marathon Championships. Elena Tab takes the third, or the, the bronze, the third place, 228.04. Paige Stoner, like you said, 226.02, your USA Marathon uh, Championships champion. 
And uh, the show of emotion that she had crossing the finish line too was amazing. It, she had the American flag draped around her and she knew what she had done or she was realizing it was coming to yeah. her what she had just accomplished. Saw some tears. Yeah, and amazing to see out there. But that, that's the story of the women's race and we want to move on to interview a few, a few of our guests here today. We've got Futsum Zenesalasi sitting behind us. Hey Futsum, you ready to come in? Come on in. Thank you. Yeah, we've got the uh, the U.S. marathon champion. It was your first marathon ever. Uh, we we actually just did a recap of your race, and we talked about how you were kind of a ghost, like haunting that that pack of five that was rolling up and and trying to catch Brendan Gregg out there. Uh, what were your thoughts as you were? As Brendan shot out there, were you, what were you thinking? First of all, wait, let me step back because I'm talking a lot and I have so many questions. But uh, was your goal to place first today? Well, with, with Marathon, I think it's really hard to um, set up. I mean, I think the goal is, you know, you want to run well, um, and especially with your first one. I don't know what, what that means. You know, I don't know. Well, means just just... You know, without oh, hitting, oh, without, we gotta <laughs> without, hold the um, close. Uh, you know how they say after 20 miles, like you hit the wall, you know, uh, the goal is <laughs> trying to run as, as, as far as you can toward the end of the race without hitting the wall. Uh, that was my goal. But at the beginning of the race, I couldn't really make my decision and, and how I wanted to race it because some people that I, I know uh, just from Flagstaff, you know, talking about if you go out too hard, you know, you might hit the wall. Uh, so. I was trying to make a decision. You know, should I go with that front pack? Should I, should I, you know, should I chase? Um, but then I think two miles into the race, I made the decision. I was like, you know what? Um, this will be an experience. Obviously, I'm, you know, I'm not just coming out of college. I do want to run well, but at the same time, it's my first marathon, so um, uh, it was an experience for me. Skip, you made a decisive move at around 35k. Was that planned beforehand? Yeah, really quick. There was no, there was no wall. Like it seemed like, I see, it seemed like the race hit a wall. Hit the the wall hit Footsum and and landed on a lot of the other athletes. Um, I wanted, I wanted, I was feeling really good, so I wanted, I wanted to go a little earlier, maybe around twenty mile. But you know, just respecting the distance, I I don't know how I'm gonna feel. Maybe you know two three miles, but I got to twenty three, knowing that I've only got five k. Um, you know, I have an idea. You know how that feel and you know practice you know from uh, race experience so when i was making that when i made that decision but it wasn't a decision that my coach and i talked about it was just it was uh from the race um it's like if i'm gonna go i'm gonna go hard and i did go a little too hard than i needed to you know i, I forgot you know you could slowly you know uh, pick up the pace but i just don't want to give any of those guys any hope like uh, i just want to go as hard as i can for that mile and then see make a make some space and then try to hold it to the finish. But it seemed like talking, you know, even seeing them or talking them, like that was that strategy or that execution of going, not just inching away, but just going hard fast did have the effect of immediately breaking them and making it a fight for second because nobody, nobody went with you and they, you know, like nobody, it, you left them no chance to think that they could win it <laughs> well that was the plan and i'm really happy it worked but the plan was you know not really t not to give any of those guys i think we were i don't know if we were four deep and um and it's still like i was i was not trying to look back just because if somebody was coming that would be <laughs> that would be really uh you know too much to handle so <laughs> but i i keep thinking like the people that i've talked in, in the past like about because one mile we, we ran like 509 or so i was like oh man you know we're kind of slowing down so uh, I don't know if people were coming, you know, so I want to make sure, you know, when I make that decision, you know, I'm just going to go. Were you paying attention to splits at all, either later in the race or like early on? Because you were, it looked like you were in the pack of, you know, some of these other men um, and not, you know, certainly not dictating what speed you were running. You were kind of running with everybody else. Were you aware or were you kind of just checked out and saying i'm staying with these guys no I, I was aware of the pace just because make sure you know we're running around that five minute pace but yeah. <laughs> i wasn't 
I wasn't aware so that I could pick up the pace if it slowed down. I just want to know what we were running, you know, and then kind of have an idea how my body's feeling, you know, if it's, you know, five minute, you know, 4.55 or 5.05. It's just have an idea, you know, what I was physically and mentally. So as your first marathon, too, what's, um, you know, at 10 miles, 15 miles, you're sitting in that pack, Greg's out front. What are your, what's, what are some of the sensations? Are you thinking like, yeah, I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. This is, this is good. Or is it like, there's still a long way to go. Is this how I'm supposed to be feeling? Like what, what was, what were kind of some of the thoughts as you're sitting in that pack early on? Well, so I, you know, I've got a really good relationship with, uh, with, with my agent Marhawi and obviously his brother is Meb. Um, I rarely talk to Meb or I text him or call him, uh, but I read his book like almost three times, you know, uh, Meb 26 Miles, and he talks about how uh, 20 miles only the halfway. So even when I went through the half, I'm like, I'm not even halfway yet, you know. So I got 20 miles, like, oh, we're halfway, you know. But, you know, you only got six miles. And then knowing that CIM, the last six miles, they say, to see, you know, you could run well. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that my mindset was I'm not halfway, you know. Yeah. Long way to go, but I didn't really think much about uh, what, what's his name. You said Greg, Brendan, Greg. Yeah, like even if he goes to win, I, I don't think um, he wasn't. I don't. I just wanted to run. You know, my first marathon. I was really happy with the pack I was in, but then when he came, uh, we were really happy. You know, now we're talking about you know, like eight more thousand pay. You know, or, or yeah. seventy five. So that bags out there. Yeah, now that you can go for. <laughs> um, describe so this is your first marathon. Describe how your body felt after you crossed the finish line. Have you ever felt that like that after a race? <laughs> yeah, the, the last mile was like it was joyful, but it, it was a grind as well because I um, I want to make sure you know like no one comes behind and and, uh, and beat me. But um, uh, uh, you know, surprisingly, I was really happy. You know, like you know, the marathon God hasn't really today was. You know how it is for some people, like on their debut, to just to have a good marathon run. You know, so that was for me. So, uh, you know, even my body right now, my hamstrings a little tight just because, uh, um, like the the road was wet, and um, um, I think uh, my hamstring was overworking on that. Other than that, uh, I'm actually in a really good shape. And now, uh, going into Orlando, 2024, you you have like you're the U.S. champion. You're the U.S. champion in the marathon. You've had an amazing debut. What's on your mind going into that race? Is is that the next big goal? Uh, and and what are you thinking about heading into that? I think, you know, I'd like to um, do a second marathon before that. I don't know if we're going to do that or not. Uh, but obviously, you know, working with um, Coach Allen, you know, um, <laughs> you know, he has a great resume in, in, in that distance. Um, you know, he has done so well. Who's your coach again? Allen. I don't even know how to pronounce his last name, man. Uh, he, he won the 2004 Olympic trial, man. Yeah, Cole Pepper. Oh, Cole, Cole Pepper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. I hope he's not here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we're waving at him. Um, no, but uh, I'm just I'm excited, you know, to continue to work with him and and, and 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 learn from him as much as I can in terms of you know how to compete on those you know Olympic trials, you know, year championship races. So. Um, so the goal has to be. The it team. is a trial, huh? and to make the team now. Oh yeah, yeah, think. yeah. yeah. I, I think anything that we do from here uh, till then is, is is around like to put myself in a great position to compete um, for that top three. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for for joining us today. And uh, man, you got you got your American flag and and you got the win. Yeah. You got a nice payday. So uh, what's up next? How are you going to celebrate? <laughs> um, man. You know, being a marathon, you know, marathon man and having a, you know, a wife and a kid, you know. Um, now you're a marathon man. Well, done like, one race. No, it's just, you know, you're always tired. You know, you barely spend much time with your family. So I'm just, I'm really excited to spend as much time as I can, you know, with my wife and my son. So. <laughs> hey, that's, that sounds like a blast. That sounds like the way to do it. Thank you. But, uh, yeah. Thank thanks you. a ton, Footsum. And uh, right. yeah, good luck to you in the future, man. Thank you so much. Guys. Great work. All right, we see Jacob Thompson over there chewing some some bacon and eggs, but uh, he's gonna he's gonna hobble over here. Beautiful. Uh, great talk with put some Zenasalasi there, and we think we can get some of the women up here too. Uh, they're coming back from the award ceremony right now in front of the Capitol. Jacob, go ahead and pick that up. Hello. How you doing, man? Uh, pretty good. 
pretty solid. Yeah. yeah. So uh, looking at it from the lead vehicle, you were uh, you were kind of you were a driving force in that that chase pack for a long time. Like Brendan Gregg was out front. Yeah. And uh, you and Easy Ed Goddard up there in the yellow singlet, you were kind of rotating around and, and pushing the pace mostly. Uh, what was going through your mind and or heading into this? What was your strategy? Yeah, I mean, coming in, like, I, I wanted to win the race. Uh, so my strategy was to basically stay with that group no matter what. Uh, I think we had kind of said if one guy went ahead, let him go. Because um, usually those guys come back. Uh, obviously, somebody like Brennan, who, you know, knows this course, won this race last year, ran 211 here last year. Like, you don't want to let him get too far away. Yeah, did that shake your confidence when you saw Brendan, who had won it last year in that, that, that way, go out there? No, I think we had like a good enough group that even if he had stayed a little bit more ahead, that we, I don't know, we, we probably would have done something eventually to, to go get him. Because uh, we could, I wanted to keep him like in eyesight, uh, which, you know, I think he, he kind of got that lead and he kind of stayed there. If he would have kept pulling away, I think it probably would have been a different story. Uh, Were you guys getting any information uh, how far ahead he was? We weren't, but we could see him. So every so often I would like take a split just to keep a ballpark on, on where he was and then once we saw him like come back to us it was like oh he's that far ahead he's that far ahead and then all of a sudden he's like oh he's right he's right there in front of us uh so like i think that that part kind of worked out well but uh yeah i mean ed did a ton of the work uh in the race and i think you know i was happy to to share it with him i, I really if you've seen some of the other road races i've run i get a little anxious sometimes i like to i like to hit it hard uh so patience is one thing that uh there's probably about eight people yesterday who were just like, don't touch the front. And uh, I pretty much listened. Yeah, you, you listened to him until the, the end, which, like, that, that was a very impressive thing to watch uh, as you got past halfway and you passed Brendan Gregg at about mile 18. You were kind of the, the conductor on that group there, like, pushing the, the pack, and it's easy to see in the, in the bright Under Armour singlet. So, yeah. yeah, all the fans could see you storming along the course. But... Um, yeah, you, what did you think when Footsum, who was just kind of, we were calling him a ghost in the pack, really, because he didn't take the lead until he made his move. What went through your mind when that, that move was made? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I tried to get Footsum to, to lead or tried to get, sneak my way behind him, uh, but to, to no avail, he, he made sure he st stayed behind me. Uh, and then, yeah, he, he hit it, and he hit it pretty hard, which I think is, you know, we kind of all know like that's if you're going to put somebody away in a road race like you need to make that move and make it decisive and he did just that and yeah I think I latched on for maybe like 10 seconds or so and then uh yeah he was gone he was gone after that and uh, so I started focusing on uh, you know what do I got to do to to make sure I, I'd had a really good race up to that point uh I think it would have been easy to to throw in the towel or something like that uh, so I wanted to make sure I didn't mess up my race because I, I put in a lot of hard work uh so I wanted to you know still come out with the best result possible even if it wasn't a win at that point what uh so you debuted in chicago last year um talk about the difference between that experience and this experience yeah i mean chicago obviously any of the majors i think uh you know i've gotten i've gotten to watch all the majors in the u.s uh and then race chicago so those races are just like a little bit you know, different, you know, you got people from all different countries, you know, guys like us probably wouldn't be kind of like the headliners of, of the show. Uh, and me personally, like I love racing, like racing is why I do this. Uh, so it was good to be in a race where I was in, you know, I was in contention for the win, like pretty much the whole, the whole race until the, the final couple of K's. Uh, so I really enjoyed that part. And I think like, you know, I kind of said in my, my post-race interview, like, I've never been a guy that like loved going to you know Peyton Jordan and just sitting on the rail and trying to time try. Like I want to go race and you know rub elbows with guys and uh, you know that's kind of what what this race provided as a as a U.S. Championship. So you're uh, just like tugging on Jeff's heartstrings, right? Yeah, here. you are right now. I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of pure racers. So uh, yeah, dying. now I'm a, I'm a Jacob Thompson guy. Yeah, right, you won yeah. me over. It is something that I think is is interesting for a lot of people that like I I mean I was at Chicago watching you last year and thinking of the last you know five, six miles of that race when it's just long, lonely stretches. And if you're not fighting for a place, 
it's a completely different thing. Whereas here, like you are, you're in the moment. Like yeah. you're responding to Footsum making a move at 35K. Then you're worried about the guys coming behind you and thinking like, oh man, I could be on the podium. And it's just like, it's a completely different event. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, Chicago, I didn't even, you know, so many of the Kenyan guys and stuff like drop out and you don't even know. So like, you don't really know what place you're in. So you get to that final mile and people are yelling at you. Uh, and yeah, kind of just... It almost felt like a time trial, even though you know times were slow that day. But uh, yeah, a race like this—that's yeah, you know, that's what I'm made for. I feel like. Well, now, and I can remember a few years ago where there was one American that was running under 212 in the marathon. It was just Galen Rupp, and then uh, everybody was saying, "Well, we need to get we need to get a, like a solid group of guys that are under 212." Like, look at the Japanese. Look at what they're doing. Like, where where's our our group of guys? And Running 2:11:52 uh, today. Is that right? Was yep. that yeah? That's the time. You're a 2:11 uh, guy now. Yeah, you're a 2:11 man yeah. now, and uh, and you're a contender heading into Orlando too. So, what what do you think about carrying that mantle, and what do you want to do with it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I've always been a little bit like under the radar guy for something. You know, I was like an all-American in college, but I was never like in contention for the win. And then, you know, coming out of college, it took me a while to be able to to get back in contention and, and races just, you know, stepping up to the higher level of, of competition and uh, something I, you know, that's why I do this. Like, you know, it's no, no fun to just go and train for six or seven years of your life if you're never going to be in contention. So it's good to see that improvement and see that, uh, you know, I am working my way up towards, you know, the top of the marathon ranks. And uh, that's, that's where I want to be going into 2024. Yeah, well, well, Jeff picked you for second, actually, uh, in the, in the pick'em. So he gets nine points on his scorecard for that pick. He did nail it. Uh, yeah, he, he nailed it. And uh, I just want to say too that uh, that I remember I was in Portland when you ran your uh, your 10k qualifier too, and just to see the the joy on your face there and to watch you have another success here, that's that's super cool. And at, uh, like I hope I wish you all the success going forward. Yeah, I'll have to start so. bringing you around to, to all my races. Probably Please two, do. two of my best races. You've been you've been front and center. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, will, I will I be think there. Uh, all right, correlation here definitely implies causation. We yeah. need to get you plane tickets <laughs> to all of. Uh, hey, sounds good to me. Yeah, I'll be the biggest uh, Jacob Thompson fanboy <laughs> there is. But uh, second place today, you're the the silver medalist in the U.S. Marathon Championships. So. Uh, Congratulations, and uh, what are you going to do to celebrate? Some Kentucky bourbon, or what? Uh, I'm going to Cancun. Yeah! So I'm, I'm going on vacation. I'm going to go home for Christmas, spend some time with my family, and then, uh, yeah, get my butt back to Flagstaff and start thinking about 2024. Nice. Vamos! Yeah. Congratulations again. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you at your next race. All right. You'll be there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, we are... We have Paige Stoner coming over to us now, so uh, we get to talk to the women's champion from today. Paige, hey, take a seat. Pick up that mic there. So how was the award ceremony? You just came back, waved to the crowd. What was that like? Yeah, it was pretty cool. It's my first, um, first professional win period, so... It's pretty cool. Yeah. U.S. National Championship, no less. Yeah. <laughs> you are a U.S. National Champion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, National Champion and course record holder now at CIM. What, what does that mean to you running 226.02 on a course like this that so many runners come here? Like we've, we've talked about the depth ad nauseum and how there were 300 runners that are in contention to to run the, the Olympic trials qualifiers. And you came out on top today and set a course record, fastest woman to ever run this course. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Um, it gives me some good confidence, you know, going into 2024. Um, I had a pretty good marathon debut two years ago, and then I had a pretty rough day in Boston in 2021. So today was kind of that reassurance I needed that I belong in the marathon. And yeah, so runners like Sarah Hall ran, has run on this course. Uh, Stephanie Rothstein Bruce has run on this course. Like Emma Bates. Emma Bates has run on this course. Sarah Vaughn last year. And and out of all those runners, you are like you're now sitting at the top on that record board too. Um, what does that do for your confidence going forward and, and positioning yourself, knowing that this race is a springboard for the top marathoners in the United States heading into twenty twenty four? Yeah, that's some, some great company and I really look up to all those women that you just named, so 
um, to, to top their times is certainly, a, you know, should be a good tra trajectory if I can follow in their footsteps. Yeah, and, and J Bernsey over here was talking about how uh, you and Lauren Hurley were, were in a tight battle there throughout the second half of the race, and she was kind of pushing things early on, and then when was that point where you felt like you could jump in the driver's seat and take control of the race? Yeah, I started to sense, I think somewhere around mile 16 or 17, that she was kind of starting to hurt, um, and I was still feeling pretty good at that point, so... Um, I, yeah, I was starting to feel like, okay, if I can, I was trying to stay really relaxed through mile 20, um, and, and I felt like if I could get to that point and still feel as good as I had, like, the last five or so miles, then I was, I knew I had a pretty good chance, and I think somewhere around mile 18 or 19 is when I started to put a little bit of a gap on her. So, I, watching, you know, I was in the, the vehicle watching you two through the whole race, and one of the things that struck me was very early on from, like, you guys separated from the rest of the women at pretty early, before 10K, mm -hmm. it looked like you first had a group of four, and then it was just you and Lauren. Mm -hmm. And it looked like from, you know, basically 10K to when you pulled away um, after 30K, you were, you were both right together, but she was always, like, often one step ahead. Did you feel at any point during that, like, either you were... Did you feel like you were in total control or did you ever feel like you were like she might pull away and you were working hard to stay with her? What was kind of the dynamic for those? I mean, that's the long middle section of a race. Yeah, there were a couple points where she did pull away just a little bit. Um, and I was really just trying to stay within myself and keep a really even effort. And I know like in the marathon, you know, if you just cross that line, even it's just a little bit, you know, it can be game over. So um, there were a couple points where I just didn't feel comfortable, you know, going up a hill or something where I felt like she was pressing a little harder than I wanted to. Um, and I just kind of accepted like she might get away, but it's not um, like there's too much of the race left for me to commit to going with her. So, so yeah. it sounds like it sounds like this is the case, but going into it, um, did your did your execution today match the plan that you had set out for yourself? Uh, and how you wanted to run the course? Um, not exactly. Um, it's kind of hard knowing exactly what race pace sh should be, and especially coming from Flagstaff and it being my first time that I did my entire build at altitude. Um, a lot of the workouts I was doing, I was like feeling positive that they were they're good, and I was you know things were trending in the right direction. But a lot of times I just found myself asking like, what does this mean exactly? I don't entirely know. Um, so I felt pretty confident like 535 to 540 pace should feel really comfortable. And then I kind of out the gate found myself running closer to 530 pace. And um, I was definitely a little nervous at times, but I just felt so comfortable that I kept saying like, you know, don't panic. Like you feel really good right now. So just keep, like I said, lock into that effort and um, keep things rolling. So if I could uh, hit on that really quick, you, you run for the Reebok uh, Boston Track Club that was based in Charlottesville. Correct. Were you in Charlottesville for any period of time with that? No, I wasn't. So okay. um, yeah, I had uh, two teammates who were more track focused. And so they were kind of wrapping up, you know, their track seasons, you know, through like the end of summer. And I had ended my track season the end of June and really was just looking for some women to train with and mix it up. And so made the long drive across the country out to Flagstaff the end of July. And um, yeah, I'm really so glad. Were you in Charlottesville before that? Through oh, yes. the Okay, yep. got it. Um, and did, was it, is Chris Fox still coaching? He's not right now, no. Okay. Um, after my like season wrapped up end of June, we just kind of decided that since I was going out there and I knew I was going to want to hop in workouts with mm -hmm. other people, it just kind of made sense that, you know, I didn't want him to be writing training and then me being like, sorry, I kind of want to do this instead. Um, so, yeah, it was really just like um, a lot of my builds was um, working out with um, Emily Durgan and Sarah Pagano as they were preparing for New York. And, um, yeah, those are two people that I, I know well and was excited to be able to hop in stuff with them. So, uh, so is yeah. this largely, was this self-coached in the sense of 
creating your own programs? Yeah, a little bit. So, you know, like mileage and everything, I was, yeah, that was totally on me. And like I said, like I spent a good two, three months, I guess it was, of doing stuff with them. Um, so that was, you know, that helped. I could just be like, oh, I'm just going to do what you guys are doing. I didn't have to put too much thought into it. And then, um, yeah, these last couple of weeks, you know, once they started their taper for New York, then I was kind of on my own. Did you get some messages from them today? Yes. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't gotten to respond to anything yet, but yeah, I know they're super pumped and I really wish they would have gotten, you know, better conditions in New York. I'm so bummed for everyone that had a tough day there, um, but I know they'll get their chance. That's why you come to the People's Marathon and, yeah, and uh, you, you run can, fast. You can recommend this race now, but uh, <laughs> yeah, and your plan seemed to have paid dividends for you as well. You were overcome with emotion too when you, when you crossed the finish line. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? What, were your, what was going through your mind when you hit the finish line there? Yeah, I think I was a little bit surprised by how emotional I was because I knew going into it that I had a decent shot at winning, but I guess it's just so hard to predict kind of, you know, what's going to happen and how you're going to feel when, when you do um, get a win like that. And, yeah, I was just thinking how thankful I am and, like, you know, how everyone knows how much hard work we put into this um, to even just get to the starting line and, um, yeah, just – really rewarding <laughs> I would say what what so you go through halfway in 72 72 20 like and I think I, I think this is very interesting going to altitude for the first time being largely self-coached mm -hmm. seems like there's a big unknown of like what does any of this mean yeah so when you when you get to like you see you know the possibility of running 224 or 225 mm -hmm. um, are you oblivious to that or yeah, what happens? Because you had, it was clear you, you made a big move or at least sustained and, and dropped Lauren just after 30K or around 20 miles. But were you thinking at all about what you were going to run? Yeah, uh, there were a couple men around us who kept saying, like, we're on 225 pace, we're on 225 pace. And um, that definitely made me a little bit nervous because, like I said, I kind of thought I'd maybe come through the half more like 73, 74 minutes, somewhere in there. But like I said, I felt really relaxed. So I just kept telling myself, like, you know, don't read too much into the splits. Like you feel really good. So just keep that same effort. And um, yeah, I, I was a little nervous at times. But overall, I just kept reminding myself of how I was feeling. Well, you're the uh, you're the U.S. champion now. And we're going to let you uh, go respond to all those text messages that you're probably getting, too. <laughs> but uh, before you go. Jacob Thompson is going down to Cancun to celebrate. What are you doing? I'm very jealous. I know he's had this planned out for weeks. And <laughs> I kept saying, like, man, I really need to do something like that. That would be a lot of fun. Um, but I've actually been away from my husband for these last four months since I got out to flag. And um, he got to come out and visit once. But I'm really looking forward to just being reunited with him and my family for Christmas. And um, so yeah, no, no big vacation plans as nice as that would be, but, um, being with like my loved ones will be special for sure. Oh man, what a great way to spend this win <laughs> heading right into Christmas with the family and being yeah. able to enjoy like a nice meal and put your feet up. I'm happy for you. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, U S champion and CIM course record holder. Now we wish you all the best and, uh, we're definitely going to be pulling for you in, in Orlando. Thank so, you. Appreciate congratulations. It. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, so that was Paige Stoner, I think, looking around. That's probably it for our, our show today. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, right. We might get a few more later at the after-after uh, after party in the Ooh. hotel lobby. Get the truth come but, out uh, for the battle, battle stories and battle scars. That's right. That's the, we're going to see who was, who was battling who out on the course. And uh, there is bowling in the after party, too, which is... Uh, I would Assuming everyone's hamstrings hold up and are functional. Yeah, there, there can be a few drinks uh, had and then some bowling going on. But, uh, Jeff, it's been a pleasure sitting here and, and recapping this with you. You're a very knowledgeable guy, and you always, uh, you always uh, teach me something. Oh, it was a pleasure to be here and, and to bear witness to what a, you know, a beautiful event this is that kind of epitomizes marathon racing and that, you know, that foot race point-to-point 
journey that is that is the marathon and i think we saw we saw it play out in all of its kind of dynamic beauty today yeah and i think we should we should thank uh sacramento running association too one of the best uh race organizations in the country not only are they super organized and detailed with everything that they do but they're also nice and they're very hospitable and they welcome everybody in uh, and that's, that's why everybody keeps coming back, because the weather's great here, the course is great, uh, the best runners in the United States come in droves. This is the deepest marathon in the world, and, and that's why it's the People's Marathon. So, we will see you all next year, coming to you from the Sutter Club here. We're going to go get some eggs and bacon. Good night, everybody. Thank you.